Discovery Weekly. Welcome to Discovery Weekly, a bonus show from the podcast Discovery Show where we talk about everything else we've discovered throughout the week. I'm Zach. I'm Kirk. And I'm Matt. And I discovered something pretty cool about something not very cool. So there is something called the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Have you guys heard of this? I have. And yes. It looks horrible. It Oof. is. They estimate that it is the size basically of Texas. And oh, the insane. reason why it's happening is because there's these vortexes in the ocean. And so basically what you have is all of this circulating water is just pulling all the trash into one place. And so this is a, we're going to be hearing about, and I would honestly think that it's probably going to be, there's going to have to be technology invented to help Can us. Can you say the size again real quick? The size of Tejas. Okay. Cause Tejas. Texas. I, I heard you, but my brain didn't connect how big that was until yeah. I thought about it for a second. <clears throat> and the reason why it's it's not heavily traveled because it's kind of in this huge patch between like California and Japan. And so there's a couple different ones, but it's all based around these swirling areas that they call gyres. But that's not what I was going to talk about. But we will hear about technologies and things to try and solve this because it's a ludicrous amount of trash. And it's affecting marine life. But there was one of these things. I just read an article the other day that was kind of like a silver lining on the worst cloud ever, I guess, is maybe a way to look at it. <laughs> so the sci scientists have found out that there is 40 different coastal species that have begun using the Great Pacific Garbage Patch as like a home. So there are already like 40 species of like barnacles and mussels and shrimp and things that are essentially living inside of this mass of human being terrible to the planet. And so it's just, I just thought it was fascinating to see that like. And see a hermit know, crab with a Coke can on its back <clears throat> rather than yeah, a shell. Yeah, pretty much. It's not, really a, it's not really a good thing. But I mean, I'm just glad that the animals are trying to like doing something to try and survive because it's, it, it honestly is terrible that it's happening but essentially it's just really interesting to see how far nature will go to adapt even in the worst possible situations so i will link this in the show notes but yeah they've they've found a lot of stuff on this and then they also one of the things that this is and it's just because of how scientists think they're also wondering if this could potentially be not this specifically but kind of they see this and they wonder okay could this be how invasive species are getting places like if there's like a log that literally floated from one island to like the other side of the world could that literally introduce an invasive species because clearly these animals they're just gonna they're gonna hang on they're gonna make it happen they're they're just gonna animal it up and so it's just led to all these questions i just thought was really interesting huh. if jurassic park taught us anything it's that nature finds a way yep uh -huh. well what it really taught us is rich people will kill you <laughs> <laughs> it's true they always will so talking about uh human influence on animals i found out about this experiment that has been going on for 59 years this experiment has been going on in russia and it is about domestic domestication of animals um uh, I actually saw a thing on TikTok that talked about it. And then I was like, yeah, I'm going to go look into that. And it was, it's just fascinating. So for the last 59 years, a team of Russian geneticists led by, uh, dang it, Lyudmila Trut have been running one of the most important biology experiments of the 20th and now 21st century. It's an experiment to study the process of domestication in real time. Um, and the leader of kind of this, this experiment is Dmitry Belyev. Belyev. <laughs> I like Dmit that. I like the Dmitry Russian. B. He was <laughs> especially B. keen on understanding the domestic domestication, domestication, the domestication of wolves to dogs. But rather than use wolves, he used silver foxes as his subjects. Um, so he started this study literally not long after World War II. Um, says today the domesticated foxes 
at an experimental farm near the Institute of Cytology and Genetics in Siberia are inherently as calm as any lapdog. What's more, they look eerily dog-like. All of this is the result of what is known as the silver fox or farm fox domestication study. It began with a Russian geneticist named Dmitry B. in the late 1930s. Dmitry was a student at the Agriculture Academy of Moscow after he graduated and he fought in World War II. So this is not long after World War II he got kind of tapped to do this study. Um, so he knew that many species shared a suite of characteristics that I never really thought of, but it actually makes a lot of sense if you think about domesticated animals. They, a lot of them have floppy ears, short, curly tails, juvenilized facial and body features, reduced stress hormones, I didn't know that, hormone levels, mottled fur, and relatively long reproductive seasons. So this is actually got a name. Uh, it's called domestication syndrome. So m almost all animals that have been domesticated have some or all of these traits. And then they talk about like why, you know, some things have been domesticated, you know, for food or for transportation, like horses, for protection, and for do you know, dogs are used as protection a lot. Um, I just wanted to clarify, you're saying that after domestication, they develop these traits? Yes. Huh. Yes. Huh. Over, over a long period of time and being domesticated, they, be, they, be, they get these traits. And e there's even pictures of these foxes. You know, foxes have the pointy ears. Mm -hmm. There's literally pictures of these foxes and they've got like little floppy cute ears like you would see on a dog. Do you know? it, like, um, does domestication make them know that we think they're adorable when they're like, a certain look, you know, there's <laughs> that's like, what I'm saying. They literally, their bodies have changed to that for that reason to, to be, you know, cause I don't know how, but they know that if they do the little puppy dog face and be really cute, then they'll get more treats, food. I don't, I don't know. Mm. Um, so they literally like this experiment still going on today. So this has been 60 years that this experiment's been going on and they've done literally, I think, 40 generations of foxes. So hmm. thousands of foxes. And what they'll do is they, they have this long list of tests that they do to see which one is the most tame and whatnot. And those are the only ones that are allowed to breed. And so they've been breeding them down to be more domesticated. Because every generation, he and his team would test hundreds of foxes, and the top 10% of the tamest would be selected to parent the next generation. Um, so they've gone through like thousands of foxes to find wow. to, for, this, for the sake of this uh, hmm. test. And what I wanted to, there's a little bit, God, there's a, the cutest little fox, but it looks like a little <laughs> black dog. It looks like a little black dog. Um, Starting from what amounted to a, popula a population of wild foxes within six generations, the, the selection for tameness and tameness alone produced a subset of foxes that licked the hand of experimenters, could be picked up and petted, whined when humans departed, and wagged their tails when humans approached. Which none of huh. those things are what foxes do. Huh. Um, <clears throat> an astonishingly fast transformation. Early on, the tamest of the foxes made up a small portion of the foxes in the experiment. Today, they make up the vast majority. Um, hmm. In less than a decade, some of the domesticated foxes had floppy ears and curly tails. Their stress hormone levels by generation 15 were about half the stress hormone levels of their wild foxes. Over generations, their adrenal gland became much and much, much smaller and smaller. Serotonin levels also increase, producing happier animals, which I didn't think of that. But hmm? I mean, a, a wolf seems a lot more grumpy than, uh, you know, Normie. My <laughs> yeah, dog, it does. My small Maltese. <laughs> uh, so it makes sense. <laughs> Over the course of experiments, researchers also found that domesticated foxes displayed mutt like fur patterns um, that had and had more juvenileized facial features. Like I said, like the little baby face, like the cute little the cute little face. It looks like it's always got a smile. But it was just a fascinating study that literally has been going on for 60 years. And it basically proved the theory, right? That um, it was basically what proved the domestication syndrome. This study did. 
Really? Uh, that, that these are traits that happen as animals become domesticated. And it's funny because my second discovery later on has to do with domestication of animals as well, but it's a complete opposite, uh, which is what I thought was fascinating. Interesting. <laughs> cats become more evil. <laughs> it's about cats, uh, and it's, but it's not about them being evil. I always thought it was interesting. So I, I did hear someone say once that um, niceness is a, an evolutionary quality in animals when they're around humans, because if you're nice, you get all this stuff. But if you're not, <laughs> humans give you no, nothing. Get out of here, idiot. Yeah. Huh. And that's so interesting because it's so applicable. Like if you see a stray dog that's like, oh, hello. You know, you're like, oh, hello, dog. You know, and you help it out. You give it stuff. But if it's a mean dog, you're like, well, I'm not giving that dog anything. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't go out of my way to get bitten. <laughs> Some people might. They might be. Um, let's see. No yuck on my yum. Speaking of confusing acts. Uh, <laughs> no, not acts. Um, anyway, uh, I am going to be talking about a thing that I just stumbled upon called a Tesseract, which what the heck's a Tesseract? It's a yeah. cube that Loki's after. Exactly. It's a cube that Loki's after. It's in another movie, I think, somewhere. I think it's, it's, it's it's one of the stones in the Infinity Gauntlet, right? I think so. I think yeah. It crushed, yeah. Uh, yes, it's encased in the Tesseract. The yeah. space oh, one. Okay. Yeah. I don't know. I don't really know those movies that well. <laughs> I can't remember. It's been a long time since I've seen them. <laughs> so uh, the Tesseract is also known as a hypercube. Um, and to boil down essentially what it is into the least like the least words possible it's what a it's to a cube what a square is to a cube okay so it's like the next it's the evolutionary what uh, so it has more dimension than yeah. a cube even is what you're saying kind exactly of. I'm going to start. It's one of those things that like, it, it's almost like theoretical physics where we can't really wrap them around very well. <laughs> That's what, it, when you, when you go through the, uh, this article, it has a bunch of diagrams and stuff and all of them are like, now bear in mind that this is a two dimensional representation <laughs> of a four dimensional Tesseract. So this isn't it, you know, that ain't it boss, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm going to try my best to boil it down. Uh, we talked about it a little bit. This is, beyond my intelligence and ours, but it still blows my mind probably because it's beyond my intelligence. Yeah. Um, I'll just start with the properties of a Tesseract. Quick summary. A Tesseract is built from eight cubes. I don't know how. <laughs> don't ask me that. All of the lines that form the faces of the cubes are equal in length. Don't again. All the lines meet at the right, meet at right angles to each other. A tesseract has 16 vertices. I believe vertice is the, the uh, corner, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, a tesseract has 24 edges and the shape has, the shape has 36 edges. Okay. Uh, I'm, Both of those things I, are probably I, true and I just can't wrap my brain around that. It's been, it's been a little bit since I felt this stupid. <laughs> I, I, I fully don't understand what you're talking about. It's kind of impossible. I recommend checking out a video of a Tesseract, a representation of one. It essentially is like, like a Mobius strip. You know how it never ends and never begins mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or it continue. You know, it's something like that that like doesn't make sense until it's applied, you know? Um, so I'll just, I'll just walk through this. Yeah. Uh, these are someone else's words. I have questions, but you, I might get answers, so I'll let you continue. Yeah, I'm hoping. <laughs> I'm hoping this person has the wherewithal to talking to uh, a dummy. Us like we're like we're <laughs> kindergartners. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I'm seeing a lot of ads for puppies and stuff. So who knows? I'm hoping on this webpage. Um, a tesseract or a hypercube is the four dimensional equivalent to a cube, much like a cube is a three dimensional equivalent to a square. While a cube has six square faces, a tesseract consists of eight cells. It isn't possible to represent a four dimensional object in three dimensional space, much less on a two dimensional screen. 
But you can consider a Tesseract what you get if you have a cube within a cube, except all of the vertices form right angles to one another. Rotating such an object appears very different from what you get if you rotate a three-dimensional object. So it, from what I gather, it essentially transforms as it's rotated. What? At each angle, it's a different view of it. Like you can't just turn it and get the same kind of thing um, that you were looking at before. Now, Tesseracts are popular in art and science fiction. We know this. Salvador Dali painted a hypercube in 1954. What? That's ridiculous. I can't even fathom what it is, and he painted one. He was on a different level. Robert Heinlein. <laughs> that's true. He was on drugs. Um, yeah, a different <laughs> level of drugs. <laughs> also that. <laughs> Robert Heinlein describes a Tesseract building in his 1940 short story, and he built a crooked house. Madeline Langle, uh, and that was not me mispronouncing, that's French Langle, um, describes a Tesseract as a shortcut between three-dimensional places in her 1960 book. There we go. This is the, uh, the book, A Wrinkle in Time. That was the other one that I... Mm. And then, of course, the Marvel Cinematic Universe. The concept of a Tesseract and other higher dimensional objects has practical applications. For example, virologists construct four-dimensional maps of DNA sequences where each component of a three-dimensional DNA molecule has one of four possible attributes. Spreadsheets and databases commonly form four-dimensional shapes. The nested commands within computer programs often extend beyond three dimensions. What? For example, consider a spreadsheet consisting of three pages, which could be printed to form a three-dimensional object where the elements in each layer link to new pages. Um, a good way to grasp the concept of a Tesseract. Oh, there we go. A point has zero dimensions. It lacks length, width, or height. Okay. A line has one dimension, which mm -hmm. is length. A line is bounded by two zero-dimensional points. All right, now I'm already starting to okay. get confused here. A square has two dimensions, which are length and width. A square is bounded by four one-dimensional lines. A cube has three, which are length, width, and height. A cube is bounded by six two-dimensional okay, sides. Okay, I get it. Kind okay. of. Okay. Yeah, I'm getting there. I'm kind of getting there. It's like exponential kind of. And it know. does make more sense it does when, when you look at it. Like, I'm looking at pictures of them. You know, like the 3D representation of them. And it makes yeah. more sense what you're saying when I'm looking at it. <laughs> yes. Highly recommend looking at one to everyone listening. Uh, because, boy, it's really good to talk about what something looks like on a podcast. <laughs> mm. um, and for the Tesseract, a Tesseract or Hypercube has four dimensions. A Tesseract is bounded by eight three-dimensional cubes. So it is. Each step you go down in the dimensional thing, it's the previous steps bounding or whatever so it is it's kind of exponential in that way and i think um, that maybe what's breaking my brain is that like because i think of like okay <laughs> length because even it says the cube is like length width height what right. is the fourth one you know what i'm saying like yeah wh where what direction is it going like i don't <laughs> I, there, my brain is just not equipped for this i think is what it is and yeah. it's a theoretical thing, right? Like it's, it's not one of, it's not like a, uh, it, this is one of those theoretical like you're, you're things. You're not going to find a Tesseract. Right. Somewhere. You don't yeah. like find a Tesseract in the sand on the beach or something. No. I, mean, I hope. <laughs> well, yeah. Because that's where the infinity stone lives, mm -hmm. I think. <laughs> um, well, I will say, uh, the, I think the biggest applications are probably um, com com computational or whatever and, uh, mm -hmm. and models, you know. I'm not sure why, but, uh, you know, whatever. There's a great video on here that says understanding 4D, and it actually describes the Tesseract a little bit better. Uh, this is sciencenotes.org slash Tesseract. Um, but that's essentially all I got on the Tesseract. I just have to say this. I love discovering this because, boy, I feel like I need to know more. I need to know more about what a 4D is now. 
I didn't I, know it was an actual thing. I thought it was just something they made up in Marvel. Yeah, comics. I thought it was made up too. And honestly, I know what you mean because I do want to know more because Still literally do. No. And I don't think it's <laughs> I don't think it's it's nothing that you could have done to help me here but I still understand <laughs> about the same as when we started. Like I understand the words you're saying, but I can't like wrap my brain around it. Yeah. I, I think it's impossible for us in the three dimensional world, I believe to really comprehend it beyond numerical values. I think because as I recall, isn't the fourth dimension space, like your travel, like the, the space between, like the distance almost. I thought it was smell. <laughs> smell. <laughs> just kidding. The test I'm just kidding. You can that go on one of those, you go those, a, go on a 4D ride at a, <laughs> like at a theme park. and they, That's right. They make the smell. Like that's My the, favorite thing is that, like, we're going to spray them with water and tell them it's 4D. God, I, yeah. I yeah. hate going to Universal because you know you're just going to get sprayed with water and wear glasses the whole time. You're going to get wet. One hundred percent. Yeah, I love the idea that that you left Shrek 4D and we're like, that's a Tesseract. <laughs> I was just in a Tesseract and I Shrek was, lives there. <laughs> uh, well, uh, that was my discovery. Uh, glad everyone knows what that is now. <laughs> I, I'm going to just have to put that on pause in my brain for a little bit. I can't just <laughs> yeah. dwell on it. So I don't think I know what it is, but I know <laughs> that it is. <laughs> Theoretically, at least. Now that is 4D, Kirk. <laughs> <laughs> That's 4D. So I was looking at, I'm trying to, I'm going to not bring up any political stuff, but I saw this image that was used in response to something that we don't have to get into, but the image was the thing that got me. It is, and I will link this to the guys, and this will be in the show notes if you'd like to take a look at what the image is. But I saw this image, and I was like, what am I missing here? Why is that a response? And what it is, is it is a picture of a biplane, double prop plane from World War II, and it has a bunch of red dots on it. And so this led me down a rabbit hole of discovery. This was used in World War II. There was something called the Statistical Research Group at Columbia University during World War II that was literally, they just brought in as many statisticians as they could to try to help them solve World War II problems. And so what you're looking at is these, the planes that came back, this was where they were Ooh. hit. This is their main places they were being shot up in the field. And the conversation they were having is how do we armor planes so that they are better able to survive? Because you can't armor the whole thing because it can't maneuver. It's too heavy. And so there was a, a statistician named Abraham Wald who saw this, who saw they, because they basically got the statistic from all these planes coming back and this is where they were shot. And so several of the people in the room said, Okay, well, we see exactly where they're being shot. Just armor those places. And he said, that is incorrect because these planes were shot here and got back. What happened to the other planes? <laughs> so this is called survivorship bias. And it is a whole thing where based on what you can see, it changes your perception of what you can't. And so basically, if you look at this picture of the plane, the places you need to armor are the places that have no dots because the dots are survived shots and implied is that if you get hit in the propellers or you get hit where the cockpit is, or you get hit in any of these other places that don't have any, the plane goes down, <laughs> but you, but you wouldn't know that from just looking at it sounds the Sounds so simple when you say it, but yeah. it, it takes a really smart person to get, see that angle. Yes. And during, during like world war two, he, he discovered this and like, he has just the craziest story. He was, a uh, he was Jewish. And I believe that he was like persecuted because he was from Hungary, I think. And so he actually came over here to work because it was during like Nazi Germany. So we, we saved a bunch of people and like brought them here because they weren't being actively attacked, but he has a crazy story, but there's a lot of things that, could be called like survivorship bias 
And it's just, there's all of these like cognitive biases that they've started to try and like analyze and you can read about them. Things like confirmation bias, where you want to hear, you're more likely to hear things that confirm what you already believe. And so you're more likely to reject things that drastically go against your preconceived mm-hmm. worldview or notions. Um, but this one is, it was just a really interesting one called survivorship bias. And huh. it basically that, that was what sent me here. But then like, there's a lot more interesting ones. So another more subtle one, and you guys have probably heard this, a lot of today's billionaires, and this is a quote from this BBC article, Bill Gates and Mark Zuckerberg, for example, achieve their success despite never going to or finishing university. The fact has attracted considerable media attention. The New York Times reported on a groundswell of young people choosing not to go to university. And in 2011, Silicon Valley entrepreneur Peter Thiel launched an ongoing program that awards $100,000 to young entrepreneurs who want to drop out of school. And so basically, it's based on Bill Gates didn't go to college. So you don't have to go to college to, to succeed. But then if you look at the whole picture, it changes. So in 2018, the UK did a study. Um, the employment rate for graduates was 88% and 72% for non-graduates. And the median salary was $43,000 for graduates and $30,000 for non-graduates. So it, it paints a different picture as soon as you mm-hmm. start looking at a different like set of information. And so it's just interesting to think about. I, I always just liked exploring these like cognitive biases because it's not something you consciously put on. It's about looking at the information incorrectly or not looking at the, the full breadth of the information and seeing what the other potentials are. But basically it all just started because I saw that picture of the plane. I was like, what am I missing here? Why is there a plane mm. with a bunch of red dots on it? <laughs> that reminds me of like Malcolm Gladwell's book outliers where mm-hmm. he talks about stuff like that where it's like no it's not it, bill gates isn't a genius because he's a genius he had specific things that also fell into his lap perfectly that if one of those wouldn't have worked would not have you know he would not have been successful mm-hmm. you know he would break into a that he would go to this computer lab that he just happened to live next to that he just happened to be able to have access to and he would do it after hours when no one else was there. It was one of the fastest computers in the world at the time, you know, stuff like that. And like no one, no one else even had access to those type of things. It was only a very small percent of people in the whole world that even had access to it. He was one of the ones that, that did and that capitalized on it. Yeah. I actually, I actually had a funny moment of, uh, like holistic medicine. I, I consider very survivor biasy. It's like, well, I ate Windex for <laughs> 10 years and <laughs> I turned out fine. It's like, yeah. No. But, and it's the same thing with like smoking. Cause everybody like yeah. people that are very pro smoking will be like, well, I know a guy who was a hundred and he smoked. It's like, well, where smoked. are the, all the other people that smoked? They died yeah. from cancer. <laughs> you think they just made up that stuff? But, uh, yeah. I had a funny moment at a show. I was, it was a market or whatever. And I, I went over, I was just checking stuff out and it was like, they were selling tinctures and stuff. And I was like, oh, you know, whatever, essential oils. I just, every now and again, I'll get that stuff. Not for its medicinal qualities, but it like, smells that's, good. it smells oh, great. Good. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, Ooh, lemon. Um, <laughs> but you go back there or I went back there and they were talking and they had these, this guy just started telling me about these magnets they had. And he's like, how much do you know about polarity? And I wanted to be like, well, I understand magnets, you know, fine. <laughs> but I was like, nah, go ahead. What do you want? <laughs> like, what are you yeah, Go me? ahead. Give me the spiel. Yeah, whatever. Like, I'm not going to tell you how much I know about magnets and polarity. <laughs> I mean, I don't know anything about magnets. I'm a magnetologist. I, I know sir. what a magnet is. <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> I don't like study magnets. I'm actually, sir, I'm... I'm in grad school for magnets. Um, <laughs> magnet studies, PhD. Magnets, yeah, there you go. I went to magnet school. Um, magnate. <laughs> I think uh, that's a different thing. It's a different yeah, thing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's, like, that's actually a quite a bit. Response, I went to magnet yeah, school. I went to a magnet <laughs> school. pretty good. <laughs> oh, he'd be like, those aren't the magnets I'm talking about, the dummy. And I'd be like, all right, idiot. Sorry, we keep uh, distracting from your school. Magnet school. <laughs> we could just riff on magnet school for <laughs> Sorry. way too long. 
Um, yes, and <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, but I go back there and I'm like, yeah, sure, uh, whatever. And he goes, well, we have these, we have these, I don't know, magnets. I don't remember what he called them. But he goes, when you play tonight, you should put these on the tops of your shoes and you'll notice that you're more grounded and that you're like, <laughs> whatever. And he goes, you know what? He's like, set your beer down. And I set my beer down and he's like, let me, let me do this right now. And he put the two magnets on each and he's like, all right, before he did that, he goes, get really stiff. And I was like, okay. And he took his hand and he moved me mm -hmm. a little bit. And I like mm -hmm. moved. And I was like, okay. And he goes, now watch, watch this. Puts them on my shoes and then does the same thing. And, and move. I moved less. And he goes, yeah. see, you moved less. And I was like, mm, no, I didn't. <laughs> I didn't say I didn't say anything. I was just like, wow, that's amazing. Wow. Magnets, like, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then they tell me it's like, oh, it's three hundred dollars for oh, a 12 what? pack of magnets. Holy you know, crap. and that and that'll get you through the year. I was like, oh, OK. All right. Well, you but have it's to great. Like, constantly replace your mag your magnets, I guess, because they get they get magnet. I had magnet. the exact <laughs> same spiel. <laughs> at, I think it was like a at a at a outlet mall in Orlando. Oh my God. <laughs> because they were selling those stupid sports bracelets yes, that yes. were magnets. It was That's the same what I remember. Thing. Yes. And they did the thing where they're like, pull your arm and you like are off balance a little bit. And then it, I think the whole thing is, you know it's coming the next time and yeah. so you don't move as much and that's it but it always it just don't works work it always works because yeah. the first time they do it you don't know what the freak they're doing and like, you're always you touching me you? <laughs> uh, but anyway it's just it's it's a thing it's a thing i well, know i thought it was so funny it's like the, now have you seen the stinking stuff they have for like uh golfers and stuff it'll be like a sleeve and it has like gold wire in it or something oh I'm the like, copper what? stuff yeah, yeah. The, yes it's copper <clears throat> Copper pit. so weird it's so. very strange but i that stuff always gets me because it's like i was i told i was telling carlin i was like i feel bad for these people because they actually believe this because they take this and they do this all the time and they then they attribute all the good stuff in their life to these things no but here's the thing placebo <gasps> is yes, real i was exactly. gonna say it doesn't that's really why matter I wish it, that does I do it. I it does work i know work Dude. Because they believe it works. <laughs> no, have you guys ever thought about that? Like, I can't remember. Yeah. Like, they have all the crystals and stuff now. That's like another new thing where they're like, here's this magic rock and it does X for you. And it's mm -hmm. like, I don't think it does that. But if you do think it does that, it might somewhat, you know, like placebo There's effect There's a lot of experiments real. on the placebo effect and it is powerful. Yo, yeah. I mean, they, like, you don't even have to really believe powerful. that it's going to help you sometimes and it will help you. I, I wish that I could harness that and become like a superhuman through placebo effect only. Okay. I, I, full, think, I wholeheartedly believe in everything. I think, <laughs> uh, I think we're just too smart. <laughs> Must be it. After the test rack thing, I know that's yeah, not we, it. We have <laughs> already confirmed to everyone that's not the case. <laughs> All right. So my first discovery was about humans domesticating animals, correct? Well, I have a new discovery that I found that was along the same exact lines, but the exact opposite. And it was fascinating to me because I'd never heard this. Cats domesticated themselves. Huh. I thought you were going to say cats are domesticating humans right now. I was like, oh, God. Maybe that's why <laughs> they're not really great pets. I'm just kidding. I'm not really a cat person, but um, I like when other people have cats and I can pet it. And then I actually go do away. like cats. I just don't. I've never had cats. Uh, mm. Anyway, um, domestication of animals was an amazing feat that changed human relationship with the natural world. But while a Pomeranian looks nothing like a wolf and a thoroughbred jump horse looks nothing like a wild pony and a pot pig looks nothing like a black boar, domest domesticated house cats look pretty much exactly like wild cats. That's because they domesticated themselves, not through form, but through function. And research reveals that wildcat ancestors share essentially the same genetics as house cats today. Hmm. Um, that I just thought it was really fascinating that, I mean, literally there's ancient Egyptian like proof that there was cats as pets. Um, and it was the cat itself who came to prize the territory around the homes of the ancient farmer or the wharf of the ancient mar mariner. Hmm. 
They were drawn to a plentiful supply of prey in the form of rodents, which mm-hmm. brought their species and ours to be inseparably linked. It's just, it's, it's a, it was a short article. They talk about a few other things. They say, um, rather than merging social hierarchies and breeding selectively like humans did with wolves, cats slim- simply existed in close proximity to humans without ever fully entering societal processes. They didn't uh-huh. have to do it. They, had, they just were like, hey, we can eat your rats and you'll pet us and give us milk every now and then and we'll just be here. That's why we don't really like and you because we're cats. And they're still we don't that care way about today. You. We don't care about you, but we're here. No, and I have and seen cats us. that are nice and like want to be pet and everything, but it is super interesting. They're like, we know where the mice are. They're around the humans. So we're just going to go by the humans. We're going to eat the mice and they're going to love it. And that's it. <laughs> that was the they're whole story. It. That was the whole story of them being domesticated. <laughs> that's wild. <laughs> I just thought it was fascinating that they, they really, hmm. it has a lot to do with like how smart they are. Think about how smart you have to be as an animal to be like, Hey, that guy over there, he's got a bunch of rats in his house and a warm <laughs> bed. I can get both of those things too. If I'm just cool. I just like to imagine the first cat, the first cat that domesticated itself. Somebody's like, what the, what the hell are you doing here? What is that? <laughs> Why is it in my house? And it's like, no, nah, I'm just chilling. Don't worry about it. And that's it. <laughs> I love how simple their story is. So like one but, day they decided. They, they talk a lot more about like actual genetics and stuff because they, they did literally test from like mummy cats because they literally have mm-hmm. mummified cats from ancient Egypt. Damn. They checked the DNA from that all the way to like modern day cats and they're very close to the same. Hmm. Huh. That's wild. Wow. Cats. Are we talking cats, about the, am I right? the movie, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, well, my last discovery for, oh, I guess the year. Oh, wow. Um, this is an old discovery, but I rediscovered it recently and learned that it's still going. You guys have probably never enjoyed the majesty of Henry Phillips and Henry's kitchen tips or Henry's kitchen. Excuse me. Um, my God. This is a show. I'm going to read a few blurbs. It's a YouTube show. He started this in, good Lord, I don't even know when. The first one was like 2010, maybe. I'm going to read the blurb for his second episode, How to Make Henry's Anytime Chili for One. Uh, This is a comedy show, by the way. Uh, In this installment of Henry's Kitchen, we learn to make Henry's own famous bachelor favorite chili for one. If you enjoy these instructional videos, you can watch all of them on Henry Phillips' channel, Hen Lips. Also, this biographical film, Punching the Clown, is now available on Amazon. Great movie. Uh, this is a joke. The whole thing is a bit, and I recently found out it's still going on. So I'll boil it down for everybody. This is a show about a guy who puts on a cooking show by himself. He films it. He edits it. He even does the music for it. You learn that later, um, but you'll <laughs> you learn it early, but then you realize it's him. Um, it is so funny because he is essentially destroying these recipes, but he's trying his hardest. The whole arc of the show is that he is this depressed, depressing, like awful <laughs> life man. And this is the only thing he has in his life. So uh, he is essentially like really trying to make his kitchen show work. There's amazing episodes. Uh, what's her name? The uh, oh god, I already forgot her name. Not Eliza Skinner. Um, uh, not Eliza Schlesinger. <clears throat> famous famous comedian is on an episode. Eliza makes- Minnelli. Liza Minnelli. Yes. That would be something. <laughs> I'd watch that episode. There we go. Um, it, it is great. It has her over for a date night. He makes sushi at home. Obviously, it's, it's terrible. <laughs> Everything goes wrong. She, she says she's not eating it because it's raw and it's not safe. So he takes all the fish out of the individual sushi that he made and cooks it <laughs> in the <laughs> oven and then puts it back in. Uh, it, this stuff looks terrible. Something always goes wrong. It's amazing. And I just learned (laughs) 
just learned that Henry's Kitchen has a cookbook. Henry's <laughs> Kitchen, a cookbook out 76 pages. You can get it on Amazon and everything. And uh, holy smokes, I'm absolutely buying this. <laughs> but I highly recommend it. It's a great watch. It's like uh, for fans of Tim Heidecker and the Heidecker universe or whatever. It's very akin to on cinema at the cinema where it's like, here's the show. Here's all the stuff that happens like around the show (laughs) that doesn't really have anything to do with it, but it really informs it. Very fun. It's a weird tone that he has. Very weird, but highly recommend diving into it. No, it sounds uh, again, hilarious. It's like there's 70 episodes at this point. <laughs> Since it's all on YouTube, right? It's on YouTube, Henry's Kitchen. It's amazing. I highly recommend it. You'll watch about 10 uh, of them in a row and go, Ugh, this is so funny. <laughs> it's just so funny. Mark and I watched it in the cabin every night. It was so dumb. But anyway. Uh, here's one of the episodes I'm looking at. How to make Henry's Anytime Chili for one. That's yeah, yeah. That's the one. Yeah, that's, that's the one. It's I think that's his highest viewed one. It's great. He cooks everything in the in the dang oven. It's so funny. <laughs> <laughs> it's so bad. I highly recommend uh for everybody. You well, guys included. Guys, I think we've reached that time. We that discovered? was all of our discoveries for this year. That was a lot of discoveries. Wow. We discovered a lot of things. Yeah. yeah. I discovered like 10 things maybe. Yeah, yeah, at like least, at least 10. ten, plus or minus ten for all of us, and uh, <laughs> it felt great. Felt great, honestly. Thank you all so much for listening. We really appreciate it. During the break, if you have a discovery, call the discovery hotline. Let us know. Get in touch, and then we will be back in the new year. But yeah, thanks so much for listening. It's really fun to uh, make the show. We're we're glad some people listen to it. Yes. Enjoy the time with your family. Enjoy the holidays, whatever you may celebrate. Just celebrate it good. Celebrate it good. Real good. Just real good. Real and, good. And don't do it. Just, don't just do it for us. Do it for you. Do it you for earned you. this. Do it for you. Do it for you. Real good. <laughs> do it for you real good. Do it for you real good. <laughs> good (laughs) (laughs) t-shirt all right friends we will talk to you in the new year Bye. Bye. bye bye this was a podcast from the pod fix network Check out more shows like it at oddfixnetwork.com.